as we pick back up with 1 Thessalonians, you recall that there's the map. You recall that Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they were steered by the Spirit to Troas. And then they sailed from Troas to Macedonia in response to the vision that Paul was given. And in Philippi, they were illegally flogged and thrown in prison. And then they went to Thessalonica and they planted the church there, the church to which the Thessalonian letters are written. A large majority of the Christians in Thessalonica, they were Gentiles who'd been practicing idol worship. This would include those who had converted from full paganism and those God-fearers who hadn't made a complete break with idolatry. Now, after planting the Thessalonian church, this is just kind of catching you up to, you know, the setting, because I went through this last week. After planning, or two weeks ago, after planting the Thessalonian church, the missionaries, they were forced to flee to Berea, and have, having spent in Thessalonica, it's hard to know, but at most a few months in the city, maybe less than that. But they flee to Berea, and Paul's experience there in Berea is similar to the experience that he had in Thessalonica. There's all kinds of tumult. And so the brothers sent Paul off to Athens, where he was later joined by Silas and Timothy. And then Timothy was sent back to Thessalonica, and he then rejoined Paul after Paul moved from Athens to Corinth. So he sent from Athens, Paul moves to Corinth, Timothy rejoins him after having gone to Thessalonica. And it's based on Timothy's news that he brought about the church in Thessalonica. That's what prompts Paul's uh, letter to the Thessalonians. Now, when we ended two weeks ago, if this works, we were looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 to 10. Let me read that again. I'll repeat a little bit of what I said, and then we'll get back to where we were, and I'll carry on from there. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 to 10, we always give thanks to God for all of you when making mention of you in our prayers, recalling constantly in the presence of our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and perseverance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing, brothers loved by God, your election, that our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and in much certainty, even as you know the sort of men we were among you for your sakes. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord by receiving the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, with the result that you became an example for all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has been sounded forth from you not only into Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth into every place so that we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves announce about us what sort of visit we had to you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, Paul, in verse 3, he says that they always give thanks for the Thessalonians in, whenever they make mention of them in, in their prayers because signs of genuine conversion bubbled out in the Thessalonians' lives, in their work produced by faith. Their labor prompted by love and their endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. They were living as new people. They were living as transformed people. Now, right when we ended, I was making the point from verse 4 that an even more fundamental reason they give thanks for them is because they knew their election. They're having been chosen by God to receive great blessings. And as I noted, the two dominant, the two major views of election and predestination 
within Protestantism are known as Calvinism and Arminianism. Not Armenia, not after, has nothing to do with the country. It's Arminianism. Now, I explained that the Calvinist understanding of election, it's that God from eternity, he chose certain specific individuals to be saved, and he did so unconditionally. In other words, he picked them without regard to anything in them or about them. And having chosen them, having elected them, he then assured, guaranteed their salvation by determining that they would believe, by calling them irresistibly and making it impossible for them to fall away from the faith. Now, all those God did not choose from eternity, they are damned necessarily because God will not enable them to believe. He will not call them effectively, and they cannot be saved without that. It is impossible for them to believe without that. That's the Calvinist take on election. Now, the Arminian understanding, which takes its name from the late 16th and early 17th century Dutch theologian named Jacob, sometimes you'll see it James, Arminius, but the Arminian understanding is that God from eternity, he chose Christ. And in that, he chose all who freely would enter into Christ by faith. If, just to give an example, if, for example, a man died, and his, in his will he said that Boy Scout Troop 101 was to be taken to Disneyland on the first anniversary of his death. Well, that person chose or elected the troop. See, the membership of which varied over time, and all who were part of the troop on that day, on the first anniversary of his death, would receive the blessing. But the election was of a fluid corporate entity. And God's election was of Christ, in whom many are incorporated. Now, of course, God knows the future, right? So he foreknows which individuals will be in Christ. Now, those individuals properly can be described as elect, but their election is in the Son. In fact, Robert Shank many years ago wrote a book titled Elect in the Son. See, it's derived, their election is derived through their identification with Jesus, and that identification is based on choice. It's based on their exercise of free will, which capacity God in His grace gives to fallen humans. Now, contrary to Calvinists, Arminians don't believe that faith in Christ is something that is absolutely determined by God in fulfillment of a prior unconditional choosing of individuals. God wants all people to be saved. He wants all people to be saved. You can see that in 1 Timothy 2.4, 2 Peter chapter 3, 9 and 10, John 3.17. And toward that end, God has granted them freedom to accept or reject His gracious offer of salvation. So that's the difference uh, in those views. Now the concept of corporate election, if I haven't been able to get that across... But the concept, it's illustrated in Romans chapter 11. There you have an elect Israel. You see, an elect Israel. It is a subset of physical Israel consisting of the physical descendants of Abraham who had faith in God. So you have Israel that is physical descendants and then you have elect Israel which is a subset of those physical descendants based on faith in God. The election is of Israel. 
But the individuals are elect. They're elect only in identification and union with the group. Individuals are grafted into the elect group and they are removed from the elect group depending on faith. And you see that there. Now, the link between faith and election, I think you can see it in, in Colossians 1-2. When you compare that with Colossians 3-12, you can see it in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. When you compare that with 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Now, I think that's the correct understanding of election in the New Testament. That shouldn't surprise you that I think that. But I think that's the correct understanding. Now, I can recommend a number of resources if you're interested in pursuing this particular question more deeply, so just come up to me after class and I will either let you copy them down or I will get your email address and I'll send them to you, which may be quicker. Now the missionaries, the missionaries here, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they know of the Thessalonians' election. They know that they're genuine converts because they know that the gospel didn't come to them in word alone, but also with powerful effect. It came to them with radical transformation of their lives and with deep conviction about the truth of the gospel, both of which are products of the Spirit. This deep conviction of its truth and the radical transformation of their lives these things are the work of the Spirit. They didn't simply hear the message. They didn't simply sit here, yes, I hear what you're saying. They were transformed by it. You see, the message took. They were transformed by the message. It was evident they were in Christ, and thus, they were among God's elect. And that's what Paul is so grateful for in celebrating, just as the missionaries. Then he says, look, just as we know of your election by the Spirit's work in your lives, so you, the Thessalonians, know the type of men that we were and how we'd been, how Paul and his companions had been during their visit. We know of your election and you know something about us. You know the kind of people we were during the visit how we conducted ourselves for your sake. We conducted ourselves in order to bless you. And that's important because as we'll see in chapter 2, some in Thessalonica were apparently mischaracterizing the visit. Right? So here comes Paul into this pagan area. He plants a church, has a little bit of time to build and strengthen it. He's chased away. And during his absence, what do you think all of these people who are unhappy, what do you think they're doing? Do you think they're encouraging them in the faith? Of course not. And so they are mischaracterized. Part of their assault on God's church in Thessalonica is for them to try to mischaracterize Paul's visit and what they were really up to. And we'll see that in chapter 2. But I think that's why Paul is saying this. It's important that they recognize they know how they conducted themselves. The Thessalonians know how Paul and, and his companions conducted themselves. Now the missionaries, they praise them for receiving the gospel with joy. This is in verse 6. For receiving the gospel with joy despite being persecuted for their faith. You see, in doing that, they were imitating the missionaries and they were imitating the Lord Jesus. Both the missionaries and the Lord Jesus joyfully endured suffering for the sake of the truth. I mean, Paul and Silas, they sang hymns to God from a Philippian jail after having been severely beaten and thrown in stocks. You see in Acts chapter 16, 22 to 25, think of that. And they were beaten severely. Thrown in jail, their feet are locked in stocks. And what are they doing? They're singing praises to God. Man. And see, so they say, in showing this joy in the face of affliction, you became imitators of us 
and of the Lord Jesus. It says in Hebrews 12, too, that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. And we can be sure that the one who commanded his disciples to rejoice in the face of persecution, for example, in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, you can be sure that he did so himself. Right? God's work is so magnificent. It is so transcendent that any suffering pales in comparison to the joy of contributing to that work or being a beneficiary of that work. You see, it's having the right view, the right perspective. Nobody likes getting beaten. But if you understand a larger view and context, there is a depth of joy that transcends that because you are part of something that is so much larger. And you see that reflected in the lives of these men and women. Hardship is the normal lot for Christians. I don't know what some of these people on television are talking about. But hardship is the normal lot for Christians. For instance, in Acts 14.22, Paul and Barnabas tell the churches in South Galatia, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. He's talking there about the consummated kingdom of God. He's already active in the inaugurated kingdom. They're out spreading the message. But he realizes that until Christ's coming, we live in an overlap of ages where there's going to be struggle and hardship and suffering and death and pain and disease. And we're going to get to focus a lot of that. And so he says we have to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. In John 16, 33, Jesus told his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. And then I, ha I see these people up here acting like Christianity is a ticket to a new Cadillac. You see, that's, that's what it's about. It's about hop in this bubble and be protected from all of the world and you'll get stuff. Okay, I think that's pernicious. I think it's horrible. It's false. Okay, we serve God, but you and I live in this world, and we ought to see that clearly from the Scriptures. Now, note that the joy they maintained in the face of persecution, this was given by the Holy Spirit. And I tell you, I hang on to that. Because I picture situations and things where, you know, they frighten me. You just look at what's going on in the world. I just sent my brothers an article yesterday about the slaughter of Christians in Nigeria. It's horrible. Killing their babies, killing their children. It's just terrible. You see, and I, I think of these situations and circumstances and I take comfort in the hope that the Spirit will give me the courage and the power in those situations. And here I look at it and he says, look, this joy that you have in the face of affliction, this is the work of God's Spirit in your life. He is producing this. Not all signs of the Spirit's presence are miraculous. You see that we have people who are just fixated on that. I want to see the power of the Spirit in your life. I want to see the power of the Spirit in being transformed into the image of Jesus. That's power. And here you see it in the joy that's coming out in the presence of affliction. The deep conviction of the surpassing value of God's work in Christ. That's brought by the Spirit. And this conviction, plus the inner strengthening that the Spirit provides, it produces joy in adverse circumstances. Galatians 5.22, joy is listed as a fruit of the Spirit. It is the Spirit generating this. And as a result of their becoming imitators of the missionaries and the Lord, this is in verse 7 to 9, as a result of their becoming imitators of the missionaries and the Lord by having joyful faith in the midst of affliction, they became an example 
for the believers in Macedonia and Achaia as their acceptance of the gospel. Their faith in the God of that message as that was told throughout the region. As this news and this talk about these people's conversion spread, how they were living, how they were acting, how they had joy in the face of affliction, well, then they became an example. Indeed, that news had already arrived in places Paul went to after Thessalonica. The news beat him there. It was already there in some places that he went. That's why it says in the second part of 8 and first part of 9 that they, the missionaries, do not need to tell about it. Instead, the people where they are tell them about their visit to Thessalonica. So they come show up somewhere and the news has already beat them and the people are telling them. We already know what went down. We already know what happened. As the Thessalonians, as, as the Thessalonians spread the news of their conversion and their faithfulness under fire, which dissemination, by the way, would have been facilitated by their location on that highway, the Via Ignatia, that east-west road there, well, as that happened, believers in other towns learned of their exemplary conduct. Now, that would include those who believed before the Thessalonians. That would include the Philippians. When they heard about it, they would be encouraged because they already are believers. And then some who were not yet believers who heard of it in advance of Paul's coming, for them it would be curiosity. It would be like pre-evangelism for Paul's work. And then after they too embraced the gospel, it would then become an example for them. You see, so this is something that has, this is ringing out in the region. And that's the way our faith is. You see, when you live consecrated lives, when we live as people in the way that God wants us to, that message and that news gets out. When it's real. You see, when it's real, and it's what God wants. Now, the news of the Thessalonians' conversion, that news of their conversion that spread, it included the description that they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. That's the second part of 9 and verse 10. Now it's easy for us in our culture and with a long influence of Christianity, it is easy for us to slip over the significance of that simple statement that they turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. This abandonment of idolatry, we look at it and say, well, of course they did. That's silly, crazy, this idea of worshiping other gods. But this abandonment of idolatry in that world, in the middle of the first century, in a Greco-Roman culture, it had a tremendous social cost. Let me read to you what Jeffrey Wyman says in his commentary. He says, the conversion of the Thessalonians is described in deceptively simple terms. How you turn to God from idols. Yet in a society where cultic and social activities were intimately connected, there was nothing simple about turning to God from idols. Such a total renunciation of all pagan deities also meant a complete rejection of a variety of social events closely associated with the worship of these gods. Such action by Christians evoked feelings of resentment and anger in their non-Christian family members and friends. The exclusivity of these Christians, their seemingly arrogant refusal to participate in the worship of any god but their own, deeply wounded public sensibilities and even led to charges they were atheists. Citizens of Thessalonica worried whether the gods whose home on Mount Olympus they could see a mere 50 miles away to the southwest might punish the whole city for the sacrilegious actions of a few by sending disease, famine, or other natural disasters. 
Turning from idols also meant a rejection of the imperial cult, thereby potentially jeopardizing Thessalonica's favored status with Rome and with the emperor. The conversion of the Thessalonian Christians involved a truly radical break with their previous way of life, a break that naturally incurred the resentment and anger of their fellow citizens. See, I want you to understand the gospel of Christ and accepting it has always been something that comes with a cost. And the temptation and the pressure is always to try to fit it in to minimize the cost, to get rid of it, to live somewhere in a gap conveniently that I do not have to say to the world, no, I'm following Jesus. Always that way. And the truth is, you must follow Christ. Okay? That will come with cost. That may cost you family members. Your family may, and you will be pressured to want to compromise what Jesus would have you do to fit in with family members. But the call is to follow Jesus as Lord. And they recognize that. And there was a tremendous cost, and it's always been there. Now, there's a lot packed into verse 10. I mean, there's a lot there. Jesus' resurrection from the dead, his ascension to heaven. The coming wrath of the final judgment and the fact Jesus is the one who rescues them, his disciples, from that wrath. Now this is an early letter. I would think that only Galatians by Paul is before this in terms of Paul's letters. We're talking about probably A.D. 50. Jesus is crucified Probably in 30, although some would put it in 33. But this is pretty early, right? And look what's here. It's just understood. What's Paul preaching? Right from Jump Street, you have the resurrection, the ascension, the judgment. Christ being the one who saves from that judgment. So there's a lot that's packed in. Just, just said simply. Right there in chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, he says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our visit to you was not in vain, but having previously suffered and having been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the courage in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in the face of much opposition. For our appeal is not from deception, nor from impurity of motives, or with trickery. On the contrary, as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we come with a word of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. You get the sense that somebody's saying that? You see, he says, God is a witness, nor seeking praise from men, neither from you nor from others. Although being able as apostles of Christ to be a burden on you, instead we were gentle in your midst, as when a nursemaid comforts her own children. Longing for you in this way, we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. For you became our loved ones. The Thessalonians, they knew that the missionary's visit to them had not been worthless. It had not been in vain. It had not been without positive effect. As some apparently were suggesting. You see, on the contrary, despite what Paul and Silas had previously suffered in Philippi. Now you think about that. Severely beaten, thrown in jail, illegally, in stocks, knowing I've just experienced this tremendous pain and suffering and mistreatment, knowing that might happen wherever I go, and still saying, I'm preaching. I'm preaching. You see? This is what, this is what they did, despite what happened to them. They had the courage to preach the gospel 
to the Thessalonians in the face of much opposition, and their preaching had great effect. The spreading of the gospel, it is fiercely opposed. You have to understand that. The spreading of the gospel is fiercely opposed. You look at it today. It's mocked in Hollywood and by self-appointed cultural elites. They act like, it's all stupid. It's mocked there. It's characterized as dangerous, corrupt, and anti-intellectual by the media. It's driven out of whatever the government touches, which is ever-increasing. It is increasingly deemed unacceptable in corporate America, and it's treated with vitriol and violence by homosexual and abortion activists. Just look at what's going on. The reason for this opposition to this life giving message, this divine message, is that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians. He says, finally be strengthened in the Lord, that is in the power of His strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the world-controlling powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is a spiritual battle raging. Now you can convince yourself and you can live your life right here. Oh no, it's not. That's superstitious. No, that's Bible. There is a spiritual battle that is raging. And that battle, you see it in Paul's life as he goes and offers to people. What happens? Beaten, jail. He goes here, chased out, riots. He goes here. Do you see what's going on? And it's going on today. It has different forms. It pretends to be more sophisticated. But there is a spiritual battle that is raging. And the gospel of Christ is opposed in this world. And we have to recognize that. We have to understand that. Now, despite the opposition they face, the missionaries, they refuse to be silenced with great courage supplied by God. They offered the Thessalonians God's gift of life. These men weren't cowards who retreated from potential hardship. Rather, they risked suffering in order to bless other people. They were willing to do that because they understood what is at stake, what is the gospel, where it's people's destiny without it. And they were willing to do that as servants of God. And they spread that message. They had courage to speak in the face of such opposition. And thus they had tremendous impact among the Thessalonians. They had that courage to speak because for they were doing it to please God. They had the courage to speak because they were doing it to please God. In the missionaries' absence, you see, some of their opponents apparently were suggesting that the real motive behind their visit, what they were really doing, see, they were trying to get something for themselves. That's what it was. You're being played. See, that was, that was the idea. That's what was being circulated. There always have been religious hucksters. They come along as parasites to religion. There have always been religious hucksters. And that's how Paul and his companions are being portrayed. And Paul points to the courage they showed in the face of opposition as proof that they weren't acting in self-interest. If they'd been trying to sell the Thessalonians a bill of goods, if they'd been acting from false motives, they wouldn't have endured that kind of opposition. Right? I mean, the snake oil salesman, when the going gets tough, he hits the bricks. He goes on to the next mark. 
He doesn't get treated this way. And so Paul presents that to them to counter this idea. Oh, these guys are playing you. They're, they got the long game going on. They're really, it's all about what they can get. Their courage was rooted in the fact that they preached the gospel on behalf of the living God. They were driven by their desire to serve Him faithfully. That was a mission that dwarfed all danger, all opposition, what they cared about. I want to be faithful to the calling you've given me. I want to speak to these people what you want me to say to them. That's what drove them. Yeah, but do you understand that you might get... I know all that. But I can't help but speak because I serve the living God. Now, we live in a culture that increasingly cannot imagine that anything is larger than oneself. That any purpose or cause is worthy of suffering or even death. But Paul and his companions, they, they knew otherwise. They knew otherwise. The Thessalonians and God himself. God is a way. God could testify if he wanted to. He says the Thessalonians and God himself knew that at no time did they, the missionaries, use flattery or a pre, you know, flattery, I'm just trying to, you know, set you up somehow. Oh, yeah, that's really great, great, great. And I'm trying to maneuver you so I can stab you. He said, we didn't do any of that. We didn't use flattery. We didn't use any pretext for greed. Nor were we seeking any type of emotional payoff. In the form of human praise or glorification. That wasn't what we were doing. We weren't trying to feed our own ego so that somebody, oh, you're so wonderful. That was the emotion. That's not what we're doing. We didn't do any of that. True preaching is a noble thing. It's not about getting. It's about giving. Now, Paul was a scholar. Paul was a man of great learning. He could have had in the world's eyes a much more prestigious career, but he chose to serve God. He chose to serve God. And one of the tragedies of today, in my judgment, is how ministry has come to be seen. It's perceived as a way to get rather than a way to give. And I know where that comes from. That's all part of the idea of tarnishing. All part of the idea of blackening the whole idea of Christian faith. You see, everybody's in it. They're just trying to get rich. And then you have all of these people on television who give everybody reason for thinking that. But that's not the truth. That's not the truth. Now, rather than being a financial burden on the Thessalonians, you see, which they rightfully could have been as apostles of Christ. They could have had support. They could have called on support rightfully, but instead the missionaries were gentle among them. As a nursemaid when she cares for her own children. You see, a nursemaid is somebody who's caring for people's children. How about, well, she's that compassionate. She's that loving to give and to give. How about for her own children? Even more. You see, so he says that's how they were. See, the right of support... For those who preach the gospel, that right was established by Jesus when he sent out the 12 in Matthew chapter 10 and sent out the 70 in Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, 7, he said, remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. So that, that principle, you see, the right of support was there. You also see in Matthew 10.10. 10. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, that the Lord commanded those who proclaim the gospel, that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So Paul says, as apostles of Christ, we could have rightfully been a burden on you in that we could have rightfully had you support us. But having the right to support 
doesn't mean that that right must be exercised. It doesn't mean that it must be exercised. And in the case of the Thessalonians, they went the extra mile. You see, to ease the situation of these infant Christians, they did not want to add to them the burden of having to support them in a society that is rapidly turning against them, and you don't know what that, that's going to mean in terms of their future destitution. So they didn't want to do that. They chose to relieve them of any obligation to support them, that, to support them, to help establish them in the gospel. Now, this gentle handling of their situation, that made the charge of self-interest doubly absurd, right? People saying they're in it for what they can get. Well, if I'm in it for what I can get, first, why am I being treated this way? And secondly, wouldn't I have then called on the right I had to support, but I didn't? So who's telling you the truth? Am I? Or are these people who are saying whatever it is they're saying? They so love the Thessalonians. That they were pleased to share with them, not only the gospel, they were pleased to share with them, but also themselves. You see, that wasn't the second bell, was it? All right, when it goes, it'll be the second. All right, so they, they put themselves at the Thessalonians' disposal. They made themselves available to the Thessalonians. So look, if anybody's being taken advantage of, it's the missionaries, right? Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They present the gospel, but they gave them themselves. So if that's what's going on, people are saying that. You have all of these reasons how they're treated, how they treated the Thessalonians, how they didn't, weren't a burden to them, and how they gave themselves to the Thessalonians. So you see that. Lord willing, pick up next week in uh, chapter 2, verse 9. Thanks for coming.